The multi-faith video asks us to take action, to dig deep and find resources. The vision of the Celts, or Celts, is one of those resources we have inherited in 21st century Christianity. The passage that David read from St. John talks about the vision of John that through God, everything was created, that God is in then everything. This is something that animated the Celts and I think in the early 21st century will be a help for us. Thou king of the moon, thou king of the sun, thou king of the planets, thou king of the stars, thou king of the globe, thou king of the sky, O oh, lovely thy countenance, thou beauteous beam, the light, the light that shines. That is a rune from Mulvern. And so the love of creation is the manifestation in the Celtic spirituality. There's appreciation in poems, in art, in runes that we have inherited and that we have heard. Our Celtic cross, you know, is on the top of our steeple and how many thousands of others. We have one this morning in the chapel, chancel with us. The divine wheel behind the back of the Christian cross that existed. Some people say it was St. Patrick who first combined the two images. We will never know. But it is a powerful image the Celtic cross, one that speaks to us still. We know that Celtic spirituality came to the Romans before the Common Era, at least came to Britain before the Common Era, and we only know a few names. Of course, we know Patrick and Columba, and we know Bridget, and we know Hilda, and of course, St. Aidan but there are so many thousands we will never know. We learn of them through their legacy, which we have inherited. The tremendous art, the depth of the lyric poetry, which is rhythmic and strong, meant to be read aloud to a room full of people in a room lit by candles. Maybe one of well, your experiences is getting lost in the beauty of the Book of Kells at Trinity College Library in Dublin. Spirituality, of course, is another way of saying our philosophy of life, the things we use to resource ourselves, our moral compass, the things that guide us and how we live. It's like an era, a mindset, a worldview. And so there, Celtic spirituality was so closely creation-based, you could not pull it apart. The braiding of the Celtic art makes that so clear. It is mystical, Celtic spirituality, a mysticism we need now to reclaim and find. It had all the paradoxes that are the actual energy of 21st century conversation both the closest of God and the farthest, how we can be both strong and vulnerable, trying to be fair and just. And of course, the fleetingness of life. Questions for us, especially now in the time of COVID. So these paradoxes are held together in tension. They're not resolved. God is both near to us and at times far. They're held together, those tensions. And it may be partially the beauty of the land, of the highlands of Scotland, of the island of Ireland. The very land itself may be what's being expressed in their faith. When you think of it, it is beautiful. But if any of you have been there, you know it is also rugged or boggy, depending on the season. It's harsh living. It was a harsh land and poor. 
and hard even in the days of Patrick, sea-washed, of course, and mild, but still challenging weather. We, in the 21st century, hold the elements of Holy Communion as sacramental elements, the bread, the wine. So imagine a way of crawling into the heart of our ancient Celtic ancestors who held creation as an element, like we hold bread and wine. Imagine if you were able to have a day where that was your transformative experience, because it would be transformational, wouldn't it? To see that this world we share could be that beautiful and that important. So who were these people? My professor in Irish history always said, you had to say Celts if you were a Boston Celtics fan. And the rest of us said Celts. It comes from the word Keltoi, which means the hidden ones. So I don't have any clue. My grandfather's first language was Gaelic. And so I, I'm going to go with Celtic, but he, that's all. So they were, of course, in Ireland, but also in Cornwall and Wales and Scotland. In other places, they had been pushed out. Maybe that's why they were called hidden people. They kept getting pushed away. And then they began to seek. And so these beautiful pictures that Joan is showing for us now is that although now we remember in our lives that we are urban people, they were rural. They were often on the move. Life was difficult. And yet they had a spiritual connection they had these leaders, whatever the truth was about Patrick or St. Aidan, there was somebody, it may not have been a literal St. Patrick, but there was somebody bringing the message, inspiring them, changing them. And what a beautiful legacy he has left. You know, that's um, 400, 432 a long, long time that that inspiration has reverberated through the Christian community. And we want to learn from that history. We want to learn from what the images and strengths were. As we look at environmental challenges today, how important it is that we claim, we claim this worldview, this sacramental worldview, and let it feed us on days when we're discouraged by what's happening. Because when it is the world is sacrament, then there's nothing that's sacred. This church is sacred out there is secular. This is holy, that's profane. We, you could even say in their worldview, that's a false divide. And the real thing is to say it is all shimmering with the beauty of God. So for many who have left the church in the late 20th and early 21st century, they have still found something that resonates in their hearts, of course, with this non-patriarchal, strongly ecological Celtic vision. So if it wasn't St. Patrick, perhaps it was Hilda or Bridget or that collectivity as they reflected and changed. And Ireland and was never impressed with Roman power the way the rest of Britain was. And so their images, their strength is quite different without that imperial touch. They often worshipped outdoors. And for those who have visited up at the camp, at any camp and gone to chapel outside, you'll have that resonance within you of what it was like. Or perhaps it's just you go for a walk, even now with your mask on, and you feel that sense of God looking at a neighbor's garden, watching a tree. So that awareness of nature gave them the beautiful sense of the unity. And so the sense of the gift of St. Patrick and all of those people, they, St. Patrick at 400 was already pulling into the early Christian church the things that were pre-Christian, of course. And so some of the holidays and festivities, and even St. Bride herself, 
may have come to us from a pagan background. That gives us richness in our resources. The Trinitarian aspect over and over again, but joined back and forth in a relationship a relationship that we are invited into. One of the most famous writings that we have that we think is from St. Patrick was called, is called The Breastplate. And it is, of course, that beautiful meld of pagan and Celtic Christian. And it may not be Patrick, but it's at least 1,200 years old. And it speaks of a vision of Christ not coming to redeem a fallen and sinful world, but one who releases a wonderful and sanctified creation. It's about unity. It's about wholeness. And David is going to read a part of it for us now. <laughs> 